Welcome back to Manufacturing Tomorrow's Workforce. I'm Amanda Del Buno. For today's episode, I'm joined by Terry Iverson to discuss attracting the next generation of workers and changing the perception of manufacturing, not only in their eyes, but in their parents' eyes as well. Terry founded Champion Now, a nonprofit organization with the goal of changing the image of the manufacturing industry in the eyes of the next generation of workers. He's also the author of Finding America's Greatest Champion, Building Prosperity Through Manufacturing, Mentoring, and the Awesome Responsibility of Parenting. Terry, thanks for being here today to to chat with me about this important topic. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Glad to be here. So can you just, I mean, start by telling our listeners a little bit about yourself, your background, how you got into you know, manufacturing perception and workforce, and where did this passion come from? Well, I'm very fortunate that I, my family's been in manufacturing for almost not quite 95 years now, and so um, I was kind of born into the industry. Uh, At first, I didn't think I wanted to work with, with my father and with our family, and then I realized I was really good in math and science, and I had this phenomenal opportunity to work within the the family business. So I kind of woke up, so to speak, and and took advantage of that. But as far as um, for the last, well, now this is going on my 40th year, but right right around year 20, I decided to get into uh, technical education and reach out to different schools, uh, high schools, technical colleges, and uh, community colleges. And and I took a a pretty deep dive uh, into that, and then I realized that there was a a great deal needed to bridge the gap. You know, they talk about the skills gap, but the gap I'm referring to right now is between industry, parents and students, and also education. There's these gaps that exist that um, there isn't a lot of connection or cohesiveness in between the three. So for all these years, I've talked to manufacturers, and every year for all 40 years now, people have said the same thing, and that is we just can't find enough skilled workers and in the manufacturing sector, I think we've done a very poor job of marketing our companies, marketing our careers, and we've kind of been, you know, kind of in survival mode, you know, not necessarily economically, but from a workforce development standpoint. Every waking minute, manufacturers spend, you know, training new people and training their existing people, and they really uh, don't have a lot of bandwidth to go beyond that. Mm-hmm. And and that's something I've tried to do is to go beyond that. I think our family has been very fortunate, and so I, th- I feel compelled to give back. But I've pretty much mentored young people most of my, if not all of my adult life. So I, I started in travel soccer, coaching soccer, and, and teaching young people, men and women, uh, about soccer, but then also about life skills. And when I finished that, uh, after about 25 years, I decided my, my skills and talents in mentoring could be applied to the industry and to young people, hopefully, uh, considering the industry. Mm-hmm. So kind of taking um, a passion you gained outside of, of work and bringing mm-hmm. it into your career as well. Exactly. It's always, like they say, uh, makes work not work. Exactly. Right? Yeah, absolutely. So um, you started this nonprofit organization. You wrote a book. Why? What do you see in the next generation workforce? And why is it important to you to shed the dirty, dingy stereotype of manufacturing in the eyes of the young people coming into the industry? Well, I mean, let's let's face it. Um, the youth are our are, are future, and we have to pay attention to it, and we have to you know do the best to be an advocate for, for our young people, at least I feel. Mm-hmm. As far as the 501c3, um, as I said, I, I was pretty deeply entrenched in the technical education. I found myself on uh, uh, a CT Education Foundation board in D.C., uh, a workforce development and uh, education uh, board in Florida for about nine years. And so I decided that I was going to try to change perceptions, that you know, the perception of our industry is really not the reality. And that's a big part of, of what's, you know, present today. So, you know, I'm on a plane on my way to Washington for a meeting, and I'm writing down C, H, change, and then manufacturing and perceptions. And as you can tell, CHMP, I'm like, oh, wow, change how American manufacturing 
is perceived. And then the ION in our nation just kind of came to me. So it actually is an acronym. So I started the 501c3 in 2012. And then around 2000, late 2015 and 2016, I had uh, started writing a book in 2013 and put it aside. And then I decided to, you know, to jump back in and try to finish it. So uh, I realized that, you know, what I had already written was not really a book. It was more just ideas and thoughts and, and stories. But then I realized how many people that I knew that were really fascinating people that were either friends or family uh, or acquaintances. And uh, I think of the 50 that I interviewed in the book, I only had to really introduce myself to about 10, 10 mm -hmm. or less. And, um, and then because I had done coaching and I believed in mentoring so strongly, and, and I also think we have a parenting uh, situation in our country that we could all be better parents. And, and the, the, the way we parent in today's world is different than the way my parents parented. That we could, we could, you know, better that. And so consequently, I draw, brought in people that had nothing to do with manufacturing, but I felt could speak to those two components also. Mm -hmm. Why do you think manufacturing still has this negative connotation? Um, why do parents tend to not want their children in this? What has made this continue on with the technology advancements and things that we've had? Mm -hmm. What is stopping families, parents, and their their children from seeing that this is a viable career opportunity? Well, one of the things you know I've said for a long time is that um, manufacturing's been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, and you know there's perceptions that have lingered for a long time. Technology. I mean, you know, I graduated from high school in '77. I didn't have a computer until I got to college, and even then. You know, they were teaching Fortran programming. So, you know, needless to say, technology has advanced very quickly. So getting the word out and getting the, uh, the change of what the reality is is still pretty much a newcomer in terms of information. Uh, there's been a lot of media and a lot of press about, you know, companies closing down, which is uh, valid. There's course, a lot of startups and a lot of reshoring. A good friend of mine, Harry Mosier, has is, is, uh, developed the reshoring initiative. And however, you know, we haven't really, the media and the, and the government measures manufacturing in terms of employment numbers. And that's not the only measurement. That's the thing about numbers is you can look at numbers a lot of different ways. And it doesn't mean that each way is, is right or wrong. Uh, in many cases, they're all right. But in order to really understand the impact of uh, manufacturing in this country, it's not just about the number of employees that it employs. Because if you look at that alone, there has been a steady decline probably from the 80s, early 80s on mm -hmm. uh, in a downward motion. But the reality is that this country's manufacturing economy by itself, compared to other countries' entire economies, is the eighth largest in the world. Mm -hmm. So it's still a huge component. Uh, it developed our middle class. It's responsible for our middle class. And I often think about when people start talking about our middle class and, and where is it and why is it suffering, they fail to realize it's suffering because of manufacturing doesn't have the prominence it once had. And we need to get back to that. But I don't, I don't fault the moms and dads, and I certainly don't fault, fault the students for not knowing. I fault us for not conveying that message. I fault the media. Um, I fault uh, the manufacturers, the industry members. I fault, you know, people like myself, and that's why I try to make a difference. How do you think that, um, you know, a manufacturer, like obviously you, you started this program, this mm -hmm. foundation, and the book and things. What would your advice to manufacturers be how, how they can get out there and help change this perception? What should they be doing, do you think? Well, first of all, I think it's great that people like you are doing podcasts and helping us, you know, that are being vocal and trying to be, uh, to educate people about it. So first of all, I, I give you guys kudos to you. Um, secondly, I think uh, from an industry spe uh, standpoint, industry can do at least two things. One, uh, Manufacturing Day is now an a, a, a ongoing entity. And uh, that started locally. Um, we were indirectly involved back in 2012. 
In Manufacturing Day, manufacturers every October have the opportunity to open their doors to parents and students to come in and see what they do. And I can not think of a better way to change perceptions than to visually show. Mm-hmm. Many of the uh, manufacturers, they have clean operations. Much of what we do in manufacturing is computerized. Uh, I say that I, I can't see a young person not wanting to be involved if they know the reality, especially when they know how much com- computerized uh, computerization and automation that we have in manufacturing. Uh, the other thing is I think that manufacturers can, can go to their local high schools. Uh, you don't have to go to, you know, multiples. You, you know, just go to one or two that are adjoining or adjacent to your, your company and join an advisory board and participate. And, you know, and, and yes, you can be a little bit selfish in, in for, your own, um, for your own needs, but be a little al- altruistic and do it for the betterment of, of the country and your community. In, in your high school. Um, I also think that you could, uh, you'd be well advised to get into some sort of mentoring role or internship role uh, at your company. And so that's just a start. But if, if most of the companies or many companies in a community or in, or in the country did that, those are some of the things I write about and why I, my means of conveying the message uh, in some manner I put all of that uh, in the book. Yeah, in, I think in it's interesting fashion. that you say that because I grew up, like, I think I may have mentioned this off air, but I grew up in, mm-hmm. um, you know, Joliet, Illinois, which has a lot of industry in and around it. Um, mm-hmm. I didn't know, you know. You are, you are not alone. Which is funny <laughs> because, I mean, there's there's oil companies in the area, there's energy companies in the area, there's a lot of industry there, and I had no idea. People People drive by businesses every single minute of every single day. And so uh, at, at some point, you know, we need to, you know, educate individuals uh, throughout our culture what is manufactured in our communities, why it's important uh, to know that, and, and why it's important to know that we make things in this country. I mean, it, I say it in the book that it's in our DNA. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of interesting because with young people, especially, you you really have to try and make some noise, I think. Mm -hmm. Because as adults, we drive past, we don't see it, and Mm -hmm. we're paying attention. Mm -hmm. It's being realistic. You know, my 14-year-old nephew has no idea what goes on around him. So if you want to catch his attention and you want to teach him about something, you really have to kind of shout it from the rooftops to get his attention and then be like, hey, we're here, you know, and you're bringing people in on manufacturing day, things like that, I think are all things that could catch that attention of those Yep. You know, they're young, and our adult tension spans are very short now. So. Well, actually, some some old old people like me have a, t- a short attention <laughs> spans too. But the one thing I'll say is, and I tell young people, I was at a high school class today. You know, I tell young people, look, you have no excuse. You have YouTube, and YouTube has everything. So if you're really curious and you get any inkling of of interest, just Google anything. You know, anything to do, how it's made, uh, the show How It's Made is awesome. Oh, yeah. Uh, the only thing that I've said about How It's Made is it shows the process, but it really doesn't focus on the careers and the people. Yeah. And that's that's something that uh, I love watching, you know, as a manufacturer or someone in manufacturing. I love watching that because I'm very process-oriented. But for a young person trying to understand watching that and understand what the career is, it's, it's not meant to be, you know, to be that, you know, for young people. Right. And it does also, I mean, it's interesting that you bring that up because it is one of the few shows, I think, that really spotlights manufacturing, but it doesn't spotlight the people. Very rarely do you see people. And if you do, it's... Very fleeting. Yes. Yes. And, and not a deep dive of well, what are they doing mm-hmm. and, and, you know, how much do they make? Uh, it, you know, to that point, you know, I think as far as young people, if, if you tell them that there's good money and, and that there's exciting careers that have computers involved. My opinion is they'll follow anything or at least look at anything that pertains to that. Yeah. And that pretty much defines what manufacturing in our country is. But once again, I tell every young person I meet, I go, you have YouTube, just you know, Google anything you could imagine that you want to see made, and chances are you'll see it on YouTube. Mm-hmm. And um, sometimes just getting out there, I think kids don't always know what jobs 
are available, mm-hmm. right? They always want to be the policemen, the firemen, the, mm-hmm. those big jobs that all kids dream of. But sometimes I think that's just because they don't know that these other jobs exist. These they, things are there. Yeah, it's not, you know, the youth of, of it's up to us as adults uh, in, in our culture, in our uh, communities, to really educate young people. They don't, they don't know. It's not their fault. Mm-hmm. Um, when I say, it's, you know, I challenge them to go on YouTube, well, they have to know what to search for, right? So I think that it, it's, a, it's a huge world out there in, in a good, challenging career set and well-paying career set. They just need to know that it exists. Now, having said that, a lot of our, our media, and somewhere along the way, someone said that we're going to be a service-based economy, which you know was a dagger into my heart, uh, when the reality is manufacturing is what has made our country in many ways what it is. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're, you know, our economy is one of, the, one of the biggest economies in the world. Uh, we still make you know just under 20% of the world's goods. Uh, admittedly, China, it, it is a global economy, and China does make over 20% of the world's goods. And, uh, and they're using technology to the hilt. You know, it's not all about anymore. It's not all about just the inexpensive labor. Some of the best technology in the world, they're, they're applying in, you know, in their community, uh, manufacturing plants. Absolutely. Well, we talked about what manufacturers can be doing. In your book, you also discuss educators, students, mm-hmm. and parents. What mm-hmm. roles do these three groups also play in, in that? Okay. Well, educators, educators have, sometimes have a tough time knowing what the market is. And, uh, and I talk about, you know, guidance counselors, for example. Guidance counselors, there should be two or three different, you know, types of guidance counselors because, you know, there's only one uh, type of guidance counselor that I know of, and they're dealing with behavioral issues. And, and the career, you know, I, everyone in education is being pushed, you know, college, 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 college. And a lot of the schools are being measured simply by that. When reality is the, the industry has changed and the industry needs more, actually needs more skill sets than it does need college degrees. Mm-hmm. And I think what you, you see is there's a, a paradigm where there's a shift uh, in what manufacturer or not even manufacturers, companies, employers want. And it is a skill and you do need to be educated in that skill. But it isn't necessarily a four-year degree or a five-year degree. And I think you'll see that changing going forward each and every month and each and every year. Mm-hmm. So educators have a tough time understanding what the market is because, you know, they're, they have their, their marching orders, so to speak, on what they need to do and what they need to accomplish. And a lot of that's, you know, dictated by regions and states and, and federal government. However, the closer that they can understand where the manufacturing community, as an example, that is surrounding their schools, um, Laz Lopez at Wheeling High School did a really good job at this, where he surveyed, you know, companies nearby and what their needs were. And when he realized that a lot of his students could go right out of high school with a skill and go right into their workforce, right in their own community, I mean, that was gold. I mean, mm-hmm. that was, you know, that was a fantastic uh, connect the dots, so to speak. Uh, so that's something that, that schools can do is understand what their community needs are. You know, a lot of young people, they want to get educated in some fashion, but not always do they want to, you know, move away. Right. Some, many times they want to stay in their own communities. And many, many times those communities need workers that have a skill. So it's, it's you know, it's a disconnect that, you know, it's, it's sometimes difficult to make the connections. Uh, as far as parents, the only thing that I say about parenting in the book is sometimes we get wrapped up and in, in we tr- we're we all trying to do the right thing for our children. And, and I believe that a thousand percent. Now, what that is, that's, uh, that's based on what you know, not something that you have no idea about. And so, you know, when the media propagates that, that just employment numbers are going down, well, why would I want my son or daughter to go into an industry that is declining? And when you look at, uh, you know, the uh, GDP uh, and what manufacturing contributes to our economy, you know, that's significant. 
Um, the other thing that I would say is, you know, young people are at their best when they're doing something that they're really passionate about, they're really interested in, and that uh, kind of lights them on fire. You know, there's a high school group I talked to today. I said, you know, there's a match between what you enjoy, what you're passionate about, and if you can figure out a way to make money at that and, and, and take your, your skill sets, you'll work long hours without even knowing you're working long hours. Right. And I'm sure you know from your career that once you put in long hours, you get recognized, many times financially and many times with advancement, because, you know, older people in, in different uh, segments of, of, the, uh, of the working world they want young people that work hard to be rewarded, mm -hmm. and they want someone to step in behind them. Right. So I think that parents, um, they shouldn't get hung up on my son or daughter is going to XYZ school. I think, I think we get caught up in that at times and, and take a step back and, uh, and say, well, you know, what's best for you? What is the best use of whatever time and money we have, either the the child or the parents and the child, because if they if they really knew about careers in manufacturing, they'd realize that you can spend a lot less money on education and get a lot more gain uh, in terms of salary and good paying salary, jobs that are open instead of, you know, someone, a mom asked me and said, Terry, how can you guarantee my son or daughter will have a job if they go into this? And I told her, I said, I can't. I said, there's a dramatic need here. I said, but that can change, you know, every few years. Who knows? Uh, but it's significant, and what people don't take into account is the baby boomers, like myself, are getting older and they're retiring. So that exit in the workforce trumps anything else in terms of the numbers that we need because the, the exit's so vast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we actually just were talking about retirement I think a few weeks ago now, but that's, you know, I, I, as somebody who, who has a hefty amount of school loans, it seems silly when it's just a, to push your kids in that direction when there are so many other options. And I was among them. My parents mm -hmm. didn't know what we had around us. And to them, mm -hmm. college was a path you take, right? That's just what you do. Yeah. It's, I, I remember growing up when I was young, I, I didn't really have a lot of guidance from um, my family, uh, or for even the guidance counselor at my school. I really didn't. Mm -hmm. Of course, that was a, a billion years ago. But, um, you know, I, I will say that young people, you need to be patient with your parents. And you have the ability as a young person to search everything and anything uh, mm -hmm. on YouTube, Google, whatever. And so you need to convince, not just because you say it, but because there's fact behind it, um, the, the point I was making earlier that I didn't finish and I got I sidetracked myself is that when the, the lady, the, the woman, the mom said, how can you guarantee my son or daughter would have a job? And I said, I can't. The, the, the flip side of that is that I know young people that have law degrees that cost well in a quarter million dollars to, to obtain. And even because the market is so saturated, they can't get a job. Right. After spending a quarter million dollars for a degree. Right. There's no degree that can guarantee, I wouldn't think, that Correct. you could guarantee he's no. going to walk out of college with a job. No. As nice as that would be, we would all love to have that, I'm sure. <laughs> Agreed. But the, but, but the need is vast right right, right. now. And, I, and and it's been vast for 40 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now that the a lot of the boomers are exiting, it's getting to be. It's accelerating again the wrong way right and you're having a lot of kids coming out with like you said these college degrees but no maybe technical hands-on skills that they need yep. on the, the floor the class i was in today there's about 22 people 22 young men and i said all right who knows anything about manufacturing and of the 22 two barely raised their hand like they were almost embarrassed to raise their hand so when you look at the numbers and and you know 90% don't know, as that as using that as an example, and 10% may know. We just need to do a better job. Mm -hmm. and, and our media needs to, uh, you know, printed and visual and otherwise, needs to understand how it, important it is to our country and that, and that these are really, really good jobs and, and with the amount of automation and computerization in it, 
it's just a natural for this, the next generation to have interest in it. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to kind of piggyback off of you had mentioned that that class was 22 young men. Mm-hmm. So in your book, you have a whole chapter about women. I do. So curious why you think that women are important in the industry and why we need to be attracting more of them. Well, th- 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 that's a, a, a great question, and, and I'll try to be brief, but it'll, it'll be hard to be brief. <laughs> First of all, uh, women bring a different perspective. Uh, men many times are very linear thinkers, okay? Uh, I know I'm a very, I, actually I have two sides that I'm very fortunate because I think creatively, but I also think very linearly. Having said that, you know, there's, the, the numbers that I state in the book um, that I got from various places is that 25 to 27 percent of the workforce in manufacturing is female. I don't necessarily believe that number. That's a high number in my perspective. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you know, our culture and our community and our population is, you know, close to 50-50. But I think women have a lot to offer, and uh, we, a lot of the the male contingent in the uh, manufacturing community needs to be more mentor-based and encouraging of women joining into manufacturing careers. I've often said that a woman that comes into our career that has uh, drive, determination, and interest, you know, they can write their own ticket. They really can. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, let's face it, um, women do bring a a different perspective. They see things that, you know, many times we don't. It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. And, uh, And I just think too many times women have not been encouraged to pursue engineering or manufacturing. Um, now, having said that, I was at uh, Niles North or Niles West, and I was, I was doing, talking to some uh, math classes. And as a result, you know, and I asked people to ask questions. And uh, probably 80% of the questions that are being asked are by the young women, not by the young men, mm-hmm. which I find fascinating. Mm-hmm. So I really think that, that the next generation, uh, that there could be a significant increase in the workforce with, with women workers in manufacturing. Uh, Elk Grove High School, I sit on their advisory board as well, and they have a, a female-only intro to engineering. And so what they found is that, you know, young men sometimes can be a little immature. Uh, I know I was. And so consequently, they'll, you know, give a, a young lady a hard time about being in an engineering course, uh, which is totally unjustified. So what Elk Grove is trying is to putting uh, the, the young women in a class by themselves, and, and they don't have that element of distraction or you know, negative influence. One of the young women in, in that class, and, and this is a pretty interesting question, she said, uh, Mr. Iverson, by the time I get into the workforce, It'll be, you know, in this case, she said, uh, somewhere between four and six years. How can you tell me what the job market is going to look like then? And I said, man, that is a fascinating question. And I said, I can't look into the future. I just know how long the need has been around, and it's getting worse, not better. And so um, I think if you go to the Manufacturing Institute's website, it'll tell you 600,000 skilled positions, manufacturing positions, go in unfilled every year, and there's two or three million uh, manufacturing positions over the next, you know, so many years that will go unfilled. And there's not many industries that can, you know, tout those type of numbers or vacancies. Right, right. And I think it's interesting that you mentioned that um, dichotomy between the the young men and the young women in Mm -hmm. that class because our influential women in manufacturing program we did a gender diversity Mm -hmm. and career development survey Mm -hmm. several months back and um the ladies who responded in the survey called it like a boys club mentality which kind of reminded me of what you were talking about with that class where and that's i think something that women we need to get past as well to help women be more comfortable getting into it and um but it's interesting to me to hear that it's happening with these young people just as much as it happens from what women are telling us in the survey in the industry itself. Yeah, and I, I, I have to challenge all of us, all the leaders in, in every industry, but in, in, in our situation with manufacturing, to, you know, to take, uh, take a stand and, and take a leadership role in encouraging women to, to join our industry. 
my daughter was in our in our company for a while, and she was fantastic. Um, my wife's in our, in our company uh, helping us, and so I'm I'm a big advocate of uh, women being in manufacturing and us encouraging that. Well, I wanted to touch on when we met off air before we had discussed that you were considering developing a series of workbooks and guides for those interested in manufacturing based off of your um, your book here. Mm-hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about that? You know, what are you planning to do? Can you let sure. our listeners in on that? Yeah, when I, when I first started to write the book, it was discussed, my wife and I discussed that, that it would be a good idea to write uh, several small books. And I, I just, I told her I can't do that. Uh, it's going to be hard enough to write a book to begin with. Now, having said that, I do contend that she was right, and breaking it down into smaller books makes sense. So when she asked me, well, who's your audience going to be, I, I said, yes. And she goes, all right, what do, what do you mean by that? Well, um, students, parents, educators and guidance counselors, and industry members. So there's really four main groups that I try to uh, speak to. So what I plan and hope to do is divide the book into smaller versions of it, of it of the book itself that is more targeted at each individual group. Then my plan is to put a workbook component inside the book, uh, the smaller book. And then I also plan on, on uh, introducing or inviting you know, two or three new interviews per small bro- book in addition to some of the existing interviews. Mm-hmm. So new content, a new component, so that, you know, someone that's sitting there and say, okay, I, I, I buy what you're saying or I'm interested in what you're, you're saying. Now, what, how do I go from here? Mm-hmm. And the workbook for each individual group hopefully would lead them through, here's some of the things you could do, or here's a financial model to show you that this is, is actually valid or to valid for you, mm-hmm. wh- whoever that might be. Mm-hmm. So we kind of covered the book. Um, and you mentioned a little bit about Champion now, but would you like to tell us a little bit more about, about the organization, why you founded it, and what work it's actually doing to make an impact? Well, I'll, I'll start by saying the reason I wrote the book is to give credibility to the foundation. Uh, all, every time I sell a book, all the money goes into the foundation. That's the way it was always designed to be. But as far as Champion now, the 501c3, what my hope is is to... Uh, do a variety of things, but basically get the message out about manufacturing careers, uh, possibly hold events at different metropolitan areas around the country. Um, I do have plans on having a a director of volunteers. Um, We haven't really gone out for uh, an ask, a financial ask, but once again, you know, getting the book written and published uh, was a a start Mm -hmm. to speak to that. The, uh, the other thing is I did do uh, my first summer camp down in Florida. I write about that in the book. And uh, it was free of charge, so Champion Now covered all the costs. So I hope maybe to continue, continue doing something like that. What was that like? What was involved in the summer camp? Well, what we did is uh, there was a manufacturing program. down. I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, and uh, my wife and I both come from there. And so what we did is I sent a CNC lathe down to uh, a school down in Jacksonville and uh, basically had, I think it was nine or ten uh, young people. I think there was one or two young women in it and um, taught them, you know, how to make parts. Basically introduced them to CNC turning and inspection. Basically, I teach them this is how you make a part, this is how you program a CNC machine, this is how you check the part that you just made. Uh, ideally, what I'd like to do is is also have a design element, uh, like an engineering element, mm-hmm. where we draw a part in one part of the camp, like a, a week one maybe, right. and then week two we actually make what we drew, and then and then also prove that we made it to what we were supposed to make it. Um, but in addition to uh, a camp like that that I'd like to replicate uh, in different parts of the country. Um, I'd also like to start scholarships once we do uh, an ask in, in terms of you know money, mm-hmm. uh, funds, because I sincerely believe that uh, there's always, getting any education, there's always financial barriers. Right. And so even a less expensive education doesn't necessarily may, mean that it's affordable. 
What you'll find also, and, and your listeners should should at least know this, is that many manufacturing companies are eager to hire and also pay for education. Mm-hmm. So many people will, will come into a company, in a manufacturing company, and then also uh, while they're working full-time, maybe take classes at night. And so uh, although it's a full load, that's one means of, of getting your skill, edu- your education for your skill that's something that you may not be able to afford, and you're still earning money too. Yeah, and we've covered some companies, um, manufacturers, that have partnered with their local schools and done things where for, like, parents – Mm-hmm. who can't necessarily put that time in outside of work, mm-hmm. that they would give them, you know, half a day, you're going to go and do this training or this whatever instead of your normal work. Sure. Maybe not exactly great for the scheduling situation, but right. they're figuring out a way to allow people to train. I think, yeah, I think they're, I think they're being more creative uh, than ever. Mm-hmm. I think manufacturing, uh, probably out of necessity and out of survival, we're on the leading edge of paying for education for, for their workforce, um, and they've been doing that for a long time. But now they're upping their game uh, because, as, as you just eloquently said, uh, it's not always feasible because of family or what have you to take a night class. Right. Well, great. Was there anything else about the foundation that you think we should know? Well, what I would say is um, I think the best way to learn more about Champion Now is to go to our website, which is championnow.org. Um, and then if you want to learn more about the book, there's a, a book component, uh, a drop-down, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, you can you can buy the book right off of there. Do you uh, have any ways for manufacturers to get involved with the organization? We do. We do have a, uh, a component to volunteer and to go on the, on the Champion Now site and, and send an email in for volunteer. Awesome. Um, I'll be meeting with my director of volunteers probably in the next couple weeks so we can try to enact a, a game plan going forward. And then the other thing, if you go on, I think it's news uh, on the Champion Now site, you'll see there's videos on there, there's interviews on there, there's articles on there. There's there's more information. So to the young person that doesn't know anything about manufacturing and wants to know more, there's a tremendous amount of information there. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, is there any other points you want to add or any key takeaways that you wanted to reinforce? Well, I think that the takeaways is that uh, that each group has their own, you know, marching order, so to speak, to be able to make a, an impact or a difference. And, and some of that impact is for the benefit of others, and some of that impact is, is for the benefit of themselves. For example, you know, parents can learn more, uh, you know, in a variety of different ways, Um I challenge them to, to listen to their to their children uh, in terms of what they enjoy and what they want to go into, and challenge them. You know, challenge them to to prove uh, that what they're saying is factual, that they're not just dreaming this up. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's all sorts of ways to do that. Um, I challenge uh, manufacturing companies to get engaged. Uh, they're, they've been engaged for a long time, but their engagement is mostly internal. In, in you know developing their workforce with from within, so that sometimes that's hard for them, and I get it. And then educators, uh, I think, you know, challenging uh, the neighboring community uh, leaders in terms of companies and what their needs are. Uh, and from a from a government standpoint, from a political standpoint, challenge our leaders to not just measure our schools in a way that only leads to one path. And, and that path is four or five year college degree. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you look at the numbers, you know we're 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 preaching to a populace that's you know ten, twenty, thirty percent tops of the of the young people, mm-hmm. and we have to worry about the other, you know, eighty, seventy, sixty percent uh, or thereabouts that uh, that need a career path uh, just as bad or more than a than a college path. Well, great. Thank you so much. I appreciate you coming in today. Thank you. Thanks for uh, being the voice so that we could be heard. And thanks to our listeners for tuning in today. We'll be back in two weeks. I'll be speaking with Joe McMurray of the Purdue Manufacturing Extension Partnership, and we'll be talking about retention strategies. Until then, stay tuned with Manufacturing Tomorrow's Workforce on our LinkedIn and Facebook pages. 